so when actually we made this arrangement to give this talk, all of what he said was true. Um, now I'm retired. I actually retired in October. So got five grandkids, two local, thank you. So classic, you know, retiree day this morning and dropped the two grandkids off at school while they were listening to Lego 2 movie. Great movie, by the way, in the back. So that said, I really haven't seen the movie because I'm always driving, but the dialogue is really, really interesting. So, you know, I did go through the trouble of putting big boy pants on, shoes, no laces. I, I can bend down, but getting up's increasingly an iffy proposition. So, um, but I did shave, mostly. Um, and I do keep actually engaged in the Middle East issues, so I'm, I'm following them pretty closely. Now in a year or two, it may be middle what, you know, maybe that kind of a deal, but right now I follow them pretty closely. But these are always issues that are phenomenally contentious, right? And these decisions you make at a strategic level in terms of U.S. policy and strategies are like 49-51 splits, right? There are great arguments on both sides. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you my perspective on this, but please challenge me, push me, either as we go, but certainly doing, during the Q&A, um, because these are tough issues. Now, Iran is obviously a you know, particularly tough nut to crack. So to do that, I mean, I really think it's important to give you some kind of global and strategic and regional context, right? There's a lot, there's always change going on, but now I think more than ever, particularly in the region, but globally as well, there are big, big, huge developments that really have an impact on where U.S. strategies and policies need to be. And there are going to have to be some phenomenal adjustments to accommodate these shifts. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Strategy is essentially a competitive enterprise, right? So I'll describe kind of where the U.S. is at, where Iranian national security strategy is at. And then we'll close with a little bit of discussion of kind of, okay, given all this, what are our realistic options going forward? What are some pros and cons? And talk at least a little bit, I hope, um, time dependent, on the challenges of deterrence. Because I think regardless of which policy option we go with, we've, we've got to maintain some kind of deterrence with Iran. Right? So that's going to be a challenge regardless of whether you go with regime change, regardless of whether you go with containment, engagement, or some other combination of policies. So I want to talk a little bit about that um, at the end. So in terms of the shifting global context, I think changing, particularly that applies to the military instrument of power. I mean, look at what we haven't been able to do in Iraq and Afghanistan over 20 years. Look at what the Russians aren't able to do in Ukraine, right? So the whole nature of power and the utility of military power is under question. Power is really diffused now. So I think no matter whether it's China, whether it's the US, in terms of leading a you know, global charge or global efforts, you're increasingly going to be stymied by lesser actors, right? We have to take that into account, maybe adjust our you know, our objectives in terms of what's realistic to accomplish and what's not, and what are the, what's a realistic assessment of what the obstacles are gonna be. Everybody in the world is doing a strategic pivot or shift to Asia, everybody. Israel's doing it in the region, the Gulf Arab states are doing it in the region for good reason, because most of their trade now goes to China, goes to Korea, goes to Japan. So everybody is doing that shift, U.S. included. So that's going to mean the U.S. just isn't the dominant decision-making power in the region or even in the world, arguably, um, any longer. So that's a, that's a big, big deal. And then the Russian, Russian invasion of Ukraine has really uh, put our traditional partners in the region in a tough spot, right? And the global south does not see the Russian invasion of Ukraine like we see it. We see it as a clear violation of sovereignty. We see it as a clear effort to upend the international rules of engagement. And the global south kind of looks at it and goes, well, what about OIF? You know, in the US invasion of Iraq, what about that? So, you know, there's a question about whether the, how firmly the US really stands behind this international order and how firmly we will bind ourselves to those rules, right? Because if we don't, you can't expect others to. So those are kind of big shifts globally, I think, worth taking into consideration. Um, regionally, the, 
the Middle East is just going on, undergoing phenomenal pace of change here. Um, the Arab uprisings that started in 2011, you know, ousted three, three long-term dictators. It's really drawn, drawn a question mark in terms of the rulers in the region, in terms of how legitimate they are, how firmly their grip on power is, which kind of goes back to the very nature of power nowadays, right? So that's a big issue for leaders in the region. They are focused internally on what's happening and not as much necessarily externally. Um, you've got a, a big change in terms of the traditional regional centers of power. If you look over the past you know, century or decades, it's been Damascus, it's been Baghdad, it's been Cairo. That is shifting uh, phenomenally to the non-Arab powers of the region. Right? The, the emerging powers now are Israel, Turkey, and Iran, all non-Arab powers. So big internal regional shifts in terms of traditional centers of power. There is a perception, and I underline perception because I don't think it's reality, but there is a clear perception in the region that the U.S. is leaving the region. Right? They look since Secretary Clinton was Secretary of State, they came out with a rebalance or pivot to Asia, and you know, the regional leaders looked at that, well, if you're pivoting to Asia, you're not paying as much attention to us anymore. So there's a real question about how firmly the US is going to stand behind our traditional partners in the region. Now, if you look at actual force deployments, not a lot has changed. Right? There have been some changes, but not a lot has changed. So I think that's kind of overblown. But these leaders are going to use that to their advantage, and they're going to try and leverage that with U.S. leaders, right? And say, well, if, if you don't provide us arms, we're going to the Russians. We're going to the Chinese. Uh, me, personally, I'd say good luck with that. Look on what's going on in Ukraine. You want to depend on Russian weapon systems? Have at it. China, no military presence in the region to speak of. A single base at Djibouti. You want to depend on them to keep the sea lanes open for your you know, oil? Have at it. You know, this is, uh, this is Major League Baseball, so um, I brought a glove if you want to play pitch and catch. Um, but that's my personal view. Um, at the same time, you do have regional actors because of this, partially fueled by this impression of a U.S. disengagement, who are increasingly taking action independent of U.S. advice and not really taking full consideration of U.S. interests. Um, I think you can see that clearly with Saudi Arabia's invasion of Yemen, uh, certainly something that didn't advance U.S. interests in the region, arguably is just bound uh, and tied Saudi Arabia down to a uh, very expensive fight, and the Iranians are countering very cheaply. So the Saudis are literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars, and it doesn't take a lot to fuel a few weapons and a few basic missile systems to the Houthis on the part of Iran. So it's a really good cost-benefit trade-off for the Iranians on that part. Um, Israeli unilateral actions are always a concern with U.S. policymakers. Um, and you can just go back to even Desert Shield, Desert Storm, when one of our big considerations was doing the scud hunts, right? Um, Schwarzkopf and other military leaders thought, well, these scuds aren't militarily significant. Right? But the Israelis were saying, well, maybe not to you, but they are to us. And if you don't take care of them, we will take care of them. So, and you've always got this kind of veiled implication as well with the Iranian nuclear program that the Israeli leaders will just say, look, we've, we've got a capacity to take independent action here. And if you don't want to back us, that's fine. But we're an independent country. We've got some unilateral military capabilities and we can take action if you don't. So that's, that's the kind of leverage that regional leaders are asserting nowadays. Um, big questions on Abraham Accords to the peace agreements, not really even peace agreements, but they're kind of trade, commercial, diplomatic agreements um, with a few countries in the Middle East. How big a shift does that represent in the region? It's a big question mark. There are good debates on both sides. Uh, we can talk more in Q&A on this if you want. I personally don't think it represents a monumental shift, but that's debatable. Um, you've got issues like, you know, with uh, are we forming a new anti-Iranian coalition in the region, particularly with the Abraham Accords, right? This is one of the reasons these Arab states are looking for partnerships with Israel. If the perception is U.S. is withdrawing, you want to look for another strong military partner in the region, 
So some of the Sun Sunni Arab states are going to look to Israel to provide that kind of muscle, right? So is that a possibility? Is it an option? Do these accords actually represent a real effort to get some regional economic integration? Because the Middle East historically has been one of the least integrated regions in the world economically. So you know, can this be a force for stability going forward? And then lastly, some big shifts. Um, up until a couple weeks ago, the big concern was are Saudi and Iran going to go to war? Um, Iran actually attacked some of the Saudi um, oil facilities. Um, just a couple of years ago. So big issue there for the United States and for the region as well. But then recently they had a rapprochement with the Iranians, agreed to exchange uh, diplomats and embassies. So kind of how that question eventually gets answered has huge implications for the U U.S. and U.S. policy. So, you know, just again, this is just this is a complicated set of issues here. But that's the background. Um, in terms of the U.S. in particular, I, I mean, there is a consensus now that the Middle East is just less vital to U.S. national security interests. Uh, during the days of Carter's, the 70s, the 80s, the U.S. was highly dependent on Middle Eastern oil. We've had the shale revolution, the fracking revolution. We're a lot less dependent on Middle Eastern oil now. So when you're just calculating U.S. interests, you go, no, it's really not vital. And again, take a look at the Iranian strikes on the Saudi oil facilities. President Trump decided not to retaliate, right? It's like, eh, not really, not our business, not worth our effort or getting sucked into another Middle East regional war. So this is just one of those underlying uh, concerns and, and directions in U.S. foreign policy today. Um, that has big implications for what the U.S. role militarily is going to be in the region, right? If it's less vital, do we have to commit that kind of military force? Um, strategy is all about prioritizing. If Asia is important, we've got to increase, put some increased focus, effort, resources into Asia. Does that come at the expense of the Middle East? And a lot of the regional leaders are concerned about that, but it's an open question. It's also worth realizing that really prior to 1990, U.S. had no permanent military presence in the region to speak of, right? So we were that outside balancing power for decades. Um, so is that a realistic option for us going forward to today? Um, Iran, in terms of hard power, and the whole point of this slide is, is really give you a quick familiarization. But the bottom line is Iran's not going anywhere, right? I mean, it's a huge country. It's almost four times the size of Iraq. It's got one of the largest populations in the region, about 85 million folks, just shy of what Egypt and Turkey are, probably about three, three times the population of Iraq. So if you really liked Operation um, Iraqi freedom, you'll love a U.S. invasion of Iran, right? Mountainous terrain, huge territory, very urbanized. Um, and so when you, you, you hear U.S. leaders talk about, well, all options remain open, eh, kind of, sort of true. Um, you know, a land invasion, probably not in the card for all these reasons, right? And they do have um, you know, a, a fair amount of oil and gas resources, too. They're number two in the world in terms of oil, number three in terms of natural gas. They do have that commanding presence over the Hormuz Strait. Um, a huge percentage of global oil trade goes through that strait, and they have the capacity to, to shut it down, probably temporarily, but they do have the capacity to shut it down. They often threaten to do that if their oil and energy isn't allowed. Um, out. So, but in terms of conventional military power, the Iranians really are um, really weak. They have old, obsolete equipment. Um, in large measure, that's because of U.S. and international sanctions on weapon shipments and arms trade. Um, so they're, they're really not a conventional threat, so to speak. And we'll, you know, talk a little bit later about, well, okay, then... What, where does this leave the Iranians and their thoughts on how to guarantee their own security? Um, but the other point worth emphasizing is there is a very deep sense of nationalism. Uh, Robin Wright is at uh, U.S. Institute for Peace now, but longtime journalist, longtime uh, 
commentator and visitor to Iran. And in Tot, she kind of likens this to uh, Tets and Pride, but times 10, right? I mean, they've got a very strong sense of history, of playing a role in the world, playing a role in the region, and they feel like they're entitled to at least have that say. So the question for the US and others, of course, well, okay, what kind of role are we interested in letting them play, if any? And, um, and in what aspects do we want them uh, to allow them to play in the region? And of course, the Iranians are not playing a very helpful role right now. Let's put that right up front, too. So they have some choices to make there. Um, of course, U.S.-Iranian relations really have a very tortured history. Um, this really leaves psychological scars on both sides. So it, it makes any kind of rapprochement or really any kind of returning to a normal relationship phenomenally, phenomenally difficult, right? I mean, from the Iranian standpoint, there was a U.S.-U.K. Uh, coup that overthrew their properly elected Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1953 when he was threatening to nationalize um, oil in the region. Um, so when we make claims about you know, democracy in the region, they kind of point to this, right? And they have their doubts about how committed the US is to, to democracy. Um, there was a point coming out of Vietnam where the US was looking to strengthen regional partners as we were kind of recovering from that uh, debacle, and Iran was one of the two major partners in the region that we focused on. So, you know, for those all those hard power reasons, in terms of Iran having a large population, um, a lot of economic potential, you know, it makes good sense for the countries to have good relations. But of course, the hostage crisis in 1979 kind of burnt that prospect to the ground. Right. So those are our are scars, and then the Iranians have others as well in terms of U.S. support for Saddam during the eight-year-long Iran-Iraq war in which you know Saddam was using chemical weapons on Iranian positions. So again, tough, tough issues to overcome on both sides. Um, what does all this mean? This really means that U.S. needs to kind of in this in this rapidly shifting context. The U.S. really needs to reassess its national interest in the region. And that's a tough question. And there's always some degree of tension in how you resolve it. So just to highlight a few. Obviously, we've got a huge interest in keeping as much energy and oil um, flowing to world markets. Right? That promotes economic prosperity for everybody. Um, but our primary means of constraining Iran has been sanctions, right? So that keeps off millions of barrels of oil on the market. So big tension with how you resolve that. Uh, in terms of regional stability, if you take the kind of 30,000 foot level picture, there really is no conventional military threat to the region anymore. I mean, if you remember back to the Carter Doctrine, right after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, um, that was kind of the wake up call for the US to establish a military presence in the region. Because the concern was the Soviets were going to drive through Afghanistan, through Iran, occupy the port, uh, the, the Gulf region, and, um, and be able to you know, control and dominate that global energy trade. So that's not true anymore. It's really weak states that are kind of threatening the region right now. That's the source of major instability in the region. That said, in terms of Iran in particular, they've got a very extensive advanced ballistic missile and drone capability that they've actually exercised directly against US forces in Iraq, against international shipping, and against other um, you know, Arab facilities in the Gulf. So, so that's a real challenge. Proliferation, if you, again, taking the 30,000 foot level, if you take a look, it's really been um, Israel's suspected possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel has a policy of pursuing ambiguity in terms of what their nuclear capabilities are. But, you know, there are plenty of scientific organizations that suspect Israel has about uh, 90 to 100, you know, nuclear weapons. So that and the fact that Pakistan joined the nuclear club, those are kind of the long-term press pressures for further regional proliferation. But right now it's the collapse of the 
international deal with Iran on the nuclear front that I think is the most immediate uh, threat or push toward further uh, proliferation, which, which is not obviously in US interests. Um, terrorism, again, is interesting because Iran is the largest state sponsor of international terrorism. Um, at the same time, they've also been a partner battling some of the Shunni, Sunni extremist groups, right? They were a partner, um, kind of a, not a hand in glove, not openly acknowledged, but the US um, turned a blind eye to Iranian support to Iraqi forces in the defeat of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, they are definitely you know, not fans of the Taliban or other regional affiliates, so they're a potential partner there. And in terms of defending Israel, um, you know, if you're a long time observer, of course, you know, Israel had a, had a really rough start in the region, right? They were outnumbered uh, by vastly superior uh, numerically and equipped Arab forces. So, you know, they have a history of defending their, um, their interests, their territory. Um, but now they are clearly the region's most sophisticated, advanced, and strong military power. So in some ways that complicates US thinking because it's not necessarily, you don't want Israel to apply that power independently necessarily. You at least want to be consulted um, about it. And the fact that Israel is essentially taking a free hand to the Iranian forces in Syria is a potential flashpoint for a larger regional confrontation. So the US needs to take that into consideration. Um, now how the US looks at the region You'll notice particularly in 2004, and you might have a guess as to why in 2004, but that really raised regional concerns about this kind of alleged uh, Shia crescent, emerging Shia crescent in the region, where Iran had developed strong relationships with paramilitary groups and militias like Hezbollah in Lebanon, like we see with the Houthis in uh, Yemen these days. So that was a real concern, but of course, 2004 was a year after the US invasion of Iraq, right? Where the US actually removed Saddam, who was a strong Sunni bulwark against Iranian expansion. And Iran took that full advantage of that to further their, uh, their influence in Iraq in a lot of unhelpful ways. So regional leaders will tell you that Iran actually controls four Arab capitals in the region. That's an exaggerated threat, but, but that's the perception in the region, and the U.S. has to deal with that. And you do see, you know, again, consistent thread in terms of U.S. policy has been identifying Iran as uh, probably the number one issue, um, and in particular, um, a, a willingness to do whatever we need to do to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And that's kind of the U.S. red line. And that's, that's just been consistent through administrations. Um, U.S. CENTCOM views are pretty clear here. And again, this has been consistent if you take a look at the you know, last several commanders of CENTCOM. They view Iran as the number one challenge in the region. And from a military standpoint, I'd say that's true. I think if you kind of zoom out a little bit, um, for reasons we'll talk about, that's a little bit less true. But you also see that given that perspective, his number one mission in the region is to deter Iran. And so, you know, hopefully we'll get to some talk about the challenges there. Um, I think, again, at this little bit higher level, and this is a DNI assessment in the purple there, um, annual threat assessment just from last year. They should be coming out with a new one. Um, anytime soon. But, but it's really kind of, if you read into it, it's a little bit more nuanced view of the Iranian threat, right? So the threat from a US standpoint is that they do want to nudge us out of the region. They clearly want US decreased influence in the region. That's clearly a foreign policy goal of theirs because they think that will free up their hand, right? To play a larger unobstructed role in the region. Um, so that's their goal. And then secondly, the, the main priority for the regime has always been self-preservation, right? So again, thinking in terms of deterrence, you need to think about that. So what steps can the US take to make sure the Iranian leadership sees that a nuclear weapons program would threaten their regime, not 
secure that regime. And, and that's a game of perceptions that has to be played out. And then, you know, the other raft of reasons here, again, I think when folks say Iran is the number one threat to regional stability, that's not true. I mean, it's the internal threats in the Sunni Arab nations. That's what prompted all the Arab uprisings, right? That's what really caused Arab leaders to recognize their position at the top of the power structure wasn't as assured as they thought it was. So the real threat to regional stability is those domestic, social, political, economic challenges that the Sunni Arab countries are facing themselves. And again, that's Boland's perspective here. And then the other part to remember is given, uh, not necessarily for good reasons, but because Iran is engaged in all of these conflicts, is attempting to exploit these conflicts and divisions for their own purposes, they will necessarily have to be part of the solution, which is regional leaders don't want to admit it, right? This was their reaction when President Obama, when he was uh, leaving office, uh, one of the things he said was Saudi and others are just gonna have to realize they have to share the region with Iran. Regional leaders were freaked out with that statement, right? But it's interestingly enough, so, but where are they now? Saudi Arabia and a rapprochement with Iran. So you might suspect Iran has quite a different view of their situation in the region, right? These US regional leaders see them as a, as a really emerging, serious, and immediate threat. Well, they take a look at the region and they go, we're a Shia minority. We're 10, 15% of the region. We're surrounded by 80% of the region that is Sunni, not Shia, that is Arab, not Persian, and that enjoy the full scale support of the strongest military and economic power on the planet, the United States. So they see their position as pretty precarious. Right, which is, again, not, not, not how the regional leaders see it or not necessarily how the US uh, sees it. And they take a look at their history. And they go, you know, as recently as World War II, we were physically occupied by Russia and the United Kingdom, right? And when they hear talks in the US about regime change, et cetera, you know, that kind of harkens back to that. That harkens back to the Mossadegh coup in 1953 and they get a little bit edgy and defensive, right? So, and if you take a look purely, and this is just one snapshot of military expenditures, and again, the Iranian conventional military is actually pretty uh, poor and obsolete, you see that they are vastly outspent by other regional players, right? And they have much better, because it's US, much better equipment um, on their side of the scale. So given all this, kind of what's their national security strategy? And you'll see every once in a while I'll put up a, um, a book or something that I think is really worth looking into if you want to investigate it further. But Ariana Tabatabai has written a book, No Conquest, No Defeat, that really does a long, deep dive. Uh, she's Iranian-American, does a deep dive into what the history of Iranian national security policy has been, and she draws some important threads. So, you know, some of it, is, is really well precedes the revolution, which has implications for regime change, right? You have to wonder if a lot of this national security predates the revolution, if we have regime change in Iran, how much really is gonna change? But basically it's a strategy from their perspective again of strategic defense, right? They look at the region, they see themselves a minority that's isolated, they have a weak conventional military, so they're gonna seek advances elsewhere, which is an asymmetric competition. Uh, General McMaster, when he was um, national security advisor, did an interview, and he was talking about this, and he said, look, there are, there are two ways to compete with the United States in terms of military power. One is asymmetrically, and the second is stupid. And the Iranians aren't stupid, right? So they're gonna attempt to compete asymmetrically. So that's where they're putting their effort, that's where they're putting their focus. And they do have phenomenal advantages in terms of the, a long history 
of deep political, economic, and religious ties with Shia communities that in many cases are alienated by the Sunni leadership in the country. So it's kind of a, a they're a ripe, um, they're, they are ripe for external engagement and support, right, that comes from Iran. Iran has built a very extensive network of Shia-affiliated militias through the region. Uh, numbers, you know, you can estimate between three, 400,000 folks in their militia. Hezbollah alone possesses about 130,000 missiles that can attack targets in Israel. So this is a significant challenge, uh, particularly for the regional, our regional partners in the region. And they've developed capacities in terms of cyber and information uh, warfare as well. So all these are, are real security challenges for the region and for the U.S. Just to kind of give a, a brief update here. So when President Trump withdrew from the negotiated JCPOA, and we can get into a little bit of detail on that later, um, uh, he applied his strategy of maximum pressure, right? So increased sanctions. Uh, we're not going to uh, funnel and, or allow any kind of shipping of uh, Iranian oil uh, so that, you know, that will deny them the financial resources to continue all these malign activities in the region. Well, initially, Iran adopted a strategy of kind of, uh, what did they call it? So strategic patience, right? They didn't, they took actions, but they were all calibrated, uh, particularly in the nuclear front, to be reversible, right? So they would increase maybe the amount of enrichment, right, from 3% to 20%. Okay, so, but that's reversible. You can scale that back. They would add some centrifuges to kind of close down uh, the so-called uh, breakout period, right, for how much time they would need to produce uh, enough enriched uranium for a nuclear weapon. But you could actually take those back offline, right? So there were calibrated steps that could be uh, reversed. But they did that for about a year. But having not seen any relief, and I would argue essentially the Biden administration has followed pretty similar policy, right? Um, they mouth a game and talk a game of wanting to re-engage in the JCPOA, but I think the Iranians, for their reasons, aren't interested right now. So you can want that all you want, but you need a partner on the other side. I don't think the Iranians, for their own reasons, are a real partner right now. So effectively, all those sanctions have maintained in place, and so the Iranians are seeking to ratchet up the pressure. They're seeking to ratchet up their leverage in case there is a return to negotiations, right? So they're taking all these steps. They've actually, again, it's worth remembering, there was an Iranian ballistic missile strike on U.S. forces in Iraq. I mean, that was Iran on U.S. forces, right? That was in response to President Trump's um, assassination of uh, Soleimani, a general who headed up the Iranian IRGC, Quds Force, right? Bad guy. But this was their reaction. And, you know, thankfully, there wasn't any further escalation. But they, they have showed they're demonstrated to take that kind of a step, right? They did very sophisticated missile and drone strikes on Saudi oil and refinery facilities. Very sophisticated. No one killed. Very few hurt. Right? So this was calibrated, it was sophisticated. And if you, again, if you take a look at the regional infrastructure, I mean, so this setback refine, it took about 20% of global refinery capacity offline for a couple weeks, right? But that was calibrated. But you also, in that same stretch of territory along the eastern coast of Saudi Arabia, you have water infrastructure, you have, you know, civilian infrastructure. So all that signaled, you know, all this, guys, is within reach of Iranian forces. So again, really dangerous escalatory steps here. And according to General uh, Kirilla, the CENTCOM commander, since 2021, there have been 78 strikes on uh, US forces by Iranian backed, not Iranian forces per se, but by Iranian backed militia in the region. So that's where Iran's at right now. Their domestic situation is certainly deteriorating, right? The very legitimacy of the regime is now being questioned in protests that are spreading throughout the country. 
You have to remember over half of the Iranian population was born after the 79 revolution. They were prior to the revolution, they were a very pro-US, very pro-Western uh, population, at least in the urban centers. And the hardliners are increasingly making the elections less and less competitive, right? So there's less event of genuine democracy and election um, available in the system right now. So more and more repression. So as that pressure increases, you know, there could be an explosion, right? And their economic situation is dire. And that's combination of two factors. One, their own mismanagement of the economy. There's been plenty of that, right? There's a lot of corruption in the economy. The IRGC, the Iranian uh, Islamic Republican Guard Corps, uh, by some estimates, controls somewhere between 50, 70% of the economy, right? It facilitates black market transactions when you have sanctions imposed uh, for so long. Um, so that's, that's creating pressure on the regime as well. And of course, that's the whole logic behind trying to get them engaged in a nuclear negotiation is to get those sanctions lifted for them. So that's their primary incentive. U.S. policy options is in many cases like this aren't really great, right? So I've kind of laid out just some basic framework here and I'll talk a little bit um, about them and then we'll close with some thoughts on deterrence and how challenging that is. But you, in, um, arguably, you know, many policies usually aren't, it's not strictly containment. It's not strictly engagement. Usually it's a combination of the two that works. But in terms of the containment, there are big questions. One we've had for decades now, we've, we've had just a policy of brutal sanctions enforcement, right? Um, so the question is, what's left? I mean, we've sanctioned their oil, we've sanctioned their non-oil. Um, so when you start doing that, you have less and less leverage to do more, right? You're essentially matched out. So big question in terms of if there's any there there in terms of a threat of additional sanctions. Um, sanctions also have a tendency to erode over time. And we're finding that particularly with competition with Russia and China. Uh, that's one way they can kind of stick a, stick a needle in the USI is having some illegal uh, sanctions, you know, busting with Iranian oil. And it works to them because the Iranians sell it below market price. So they get oil on a cheaper basis. And at the same time, they kind of frustrate US policy. So it's a win-win for them. Uh, another flip side or negative side of sanctions is it weakens the middle class. And if you're looking at eventual regime change, what you want is a strength, you know, strengthened, emboldened middle class that's going to push for that kind of change. Well, when you're laboring under sanctions, that middle class a lot of times is just weakened, not strengthened. Um, in terms of engagement, I think, you know, realistically, the only serious effort we've had in engagement was the JCPOA, the International Nuclear Deal, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, that was around for three years. It was limited, again, I think sensibly from a U.S. standpoint, it was limited to the nuclear file in Iran, right? But one of the problems with this is the regional leaders don't see it that way. They're priorities, their concerns about Iran are different. Yes, they're concerned about the prospect of an Iranian nuclear weapon, but they're more concerned about the uh, Shia militia that threaten their legitimacy today in their capitals and in their countries, right? So there's a disconnect that U.S. policy hasn't been able to quite, uh, quite straddle. Um, and big question, maybe this Saudi Iranian rapprochement might be an opportunity to do it. There's some thought that the U.S. can lead that international engagement on the nuclear front. Maybe the regional leaders can pick up discussions on the non-nuclear issues like militia, like cyber, like information uh, warfare. So that's a possibility out there, but, it, but it's just a possibility right now. We kind of have to see. Uh, regime change, I think, is pretty questionable. We don't have a good record of supporting that in the region or overall. Um, again, take a look at Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, take a look at, you know, Lebanon, take a look at Syria, take a look at uh, Libya, 
uh, we just we don't do too well in terms of regime change. And I, I think there's not a lot of stomach for what it would take in terms of the US uh, public. Um, overt US engagement and support can actually be counterproductive because what do the regimes say? See, you're a foreign stooge. You're not a genuine representative of real Iranian desires, right? You're a US stooge, you're taking US money. Um, so they use that to kind of delegitimize whatever opposition um, does exist. And the reality is, at least up to this point, the opposition in Iran has really lacked a central leadership, which is good from a standpoint of the government can easily target a center of gravity in the opposition, right? That's good, but it makes it tough to kind of really drive. We know what you're against. You're against the uh, the mullahs ruling in Tehran. But what are you for? And if you don't have a central leadership and that central vision, it, it's tough to answer that second question. And that's, that's a weakness of the opposition right now. Um, and deterrence, I think, again, I think that's going to be essential regardless of which US policy option we take. But it's tough because we don't have great insight into Iranian decision making, much like we don't with Korea. It's an authoritarian group, so who really is making those calls? Who really is the most influential voice in making those decisions? We really don't have a good idea, and deterrence is a game of perception and having to identify where those levers are. And I also think the fact that Iran is pursuing this asymmetric strategy, right? They've got a lot of backed, Iranian-backed forces, right? But when their militia attack, U.S. forces in Iraq, can the U.S. say this was directed by Iran? In a lot of cases, we really can't. So, so again, how do you target that retaliation or punishment in terms of deterrence? And that can be a tough question to answer. Um, I just want to give, this is just one example. Oh, I think if you, if you kind of dig into this and you see even uh, a lot of think tanks produce a lot of good stuff. Think tanks produce a lot of good stuff that's free, that's easily accessible, that's readable, that's by thoughtful folks. But it also produces some sloppy thinking, right? And I just, the CNAS report was just released a week or two ago. But you see here, just in terms of the policy recommendations, so this is my, this is my beef with a couple of the keys, right? One is we ought to seek a congressional authorization for the use of military force against Iran, right? And, but that ought to, be targeted toward leaders who fail to abandon their nuclear program. What aspect of the nuclear program? If they just, can they keep enrichment? Can they keep their centrifuges? There's no clear defined objective for that, right? Program. As far as we know from public intel uh, evaluation from the US, the Iranians have not made a decision to move into a nuclear weapons program, right? That's publicly what our CIA director has said. So is that, is that good enough? Is that what you're talking about? Does that satisfy the criteria for abandoning the nuclear program or not? For my mind, that's too squishy a policy objective. You need to have something more concrete. What is the red line we're not gonna tolerate? And then again, there's this, there's this reference really I mean, it's a little bit subtle, but not so subtle in terms of the US ought to pursue an assassination policy against Iranian leaders. So I say, yeah, I'm not so sure. I mean, the Israelis actually, supposedly, right, have been doing that, right? And has that solved their Palestinian problem? I don't think so. Has it solved the Iranian nuclear prog program with their assassination of nuclear scientists? I don't think so. So in this kind of, aside from the fact that it's against US law, right, that seems kind of a, a little bit harebrained scheme to me. So as you read this stuff, and again, a lot of it is really thoughtful, um, and I, you know, maybe this is nitpicking, but, but this kind of a you know, little bit deeper reflection and thought um, I think is warranted when it comes to Iran. Um, in terms of deterrence, there are two basic categories I think we need to put our buckets into. One is kind of the conventional domain, the nuclear front, the missile front. I mean, I think there's probably an argument for if we can get the regional leaders, 
to agree, look, we'll constrain our nuclear program or we'll constrain our missile programs, we'll constrain the range and payloads of our missile program, then maybe Iran can do the same, right? There might be some kind of trade-off that's available there that would actually uh, move the needle forward in terms of stability. And we've got the history of the Cold War and all the um, arms control agreements that kind of give me some hope there. But I think the key is, too, we're going to need to define our red lines, what exactly those are. Not just abandon your nuclear program, but no enrichment. I think that's a bridge too far. But at any rate, at least you know, have that kind of thought. Or we're going to you know, maintain these aggressive international sanctions or inspections of your facilities. Fine, whatever it is. But identify what those red lines are and get that regional cooperation. In terms of the non-conventional stuff, I think that's just, frankly, going to be too hard to do, right? There aren't a lot of good prospects for deterrence um, or constraint there. Uh, one, because Iran views these as essential to their own national security. They view them as defensive reactions to the superior military uh, power they face in the region. And we do have, you know, the reality is, with all these proxies, there is the question of how much control and it, the reality is it's varied control. Iranians have more control over some groups, less control of the other. And the Iranians have this perennial advantage of actually knowing the ground. And the US just doesn't have that kind of deep insight into these communities. Um, we'll wrap things up here. But in terms of the nuclear deal, this is kind of the, the basic case for the nuclear deal here. The thrust was to reduce their breakout time, the time they needed to produce and enrich enough uranium to weapons grade. And it, under the deal, it was a year. Now, in the absence of the deal, we're down to days or weeks. So, you know, I would argue that the deal was the most effective constraint we've had on the Iranian nuclear program to date. But there's a big question on whether even returning to it's possible. I mean, one, are the Iranians interested? Two, the knowledge you can't undo. I mean, they've got a lot of knowledge now in terms of how to enrich to, I think it's like 84, 86% now they're enriching to. How to uh, you know, network the centrifuges uh, to make it an efficient process to enrich uranium. Um, so that just can't be done, undone. You're not going to bomb that out of existence. And even the nuclear deal had, and this was always the case against, eventually all these constraints faded over time, right? The theory was, okay, if you're adhering, we kind of build confidence. You agree to these limits, we'll let you have a little bit more. So that's kind of the basic theory of the nuclear deal. And critics have rightly said, one, you're just talking about the nuclear issues. You're not talking about climatic issues. Fair point. Two, these eventually expire over time, and the Iranians are going to be left with an advanced civil infrastructure that, regardless of what you do, will shorten their time to get a nuclear weapon if they make that decision to do so. So again, strategy is about tough choices here. So regime change, um, there are some folks, Suzanne Malone uh, from Brookings is one of the more optimistic folks on prospects for regime change in Iran, and they point to the spreading protests. Um, color me skeptical, maybe I've just been watching the region too long. But authoritarian leaders have gotten a lot better at repressing uh, the population. And again, sanctions kind of build perverse incentives in, in strange ways. They have a tendency to actually strengthen the position of the hardliners. Of course, that's true until it's not, right? We didn't see the Soviet Union collapsing either, and it happened. So, um, so th that's just a tough one. I just don't, I don't really see it in the cards, and I don't think we've had a good record there. Um, deterrence, I'll just leave this up, and, and maybe we can talk about it at Q&A. We'll just wrap things up here. Um, but I think the key thing is deterrence is a game of perceptions. You have to have a decent understanding of the decision making of your adversary in order to affect that cost benefit analysis. I just don't think we have it with the Iranian leadership um, right now. 
And there's also the risk that as you build an effective deterrent, right, that can be perceived as, well, our position is getting weaker and weaker and weaker, so we need to strike now while we're in a relative position of strength. So an effective deterrence policy can actually kind of provoke you know, an action that you're, you're trying to seek to avoid. So this is it's a tough, tough issue to balance. So I, I, don't, I don't envy US policymakers on this score. Hopefully you have a little bit of sympathy um, for them as well. Um, but let's just leave it there. And so we'll turn it over to Q, Q&A.